in both the technical meeting of SP Section 103, SP Port Harcourt, of uh, technical information dissemination. And over this particular event is our most cherished event. Because in this event, we bring the best of the best in terms of speakers and in terms of moderator. And we have tried over the most to vary the topic across different strata of the oil and gas industry. We have held topics even on retirement for the oil and gas uh, people. We have topics on uh, finance. We have topics on uh, just anything you can think of. And today, we are here to discuss a very wonderful topic, which we will get to know. Hello. Hello, Moses, are you there? Okay. Um, that will be network issues. Yeah. Simeon, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay. So you can, we already have people on board. Okay. So welcome, everybody. I think there's a network uh, issue with the uh, secretary, Moses, uh, whenever he joins us, but we can continue. Um, Sorry, I, I think my network put me out. I, I'm okay. back. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So we'll be taking uh, the opening prayer right away. I think I already made uh, justice to the initial introduction. And I would like uh, Dr. Bamidele Oyetunde to take uh, the opening prayer. He was one of the early beds. So We'll skip that for instead of a volunteer, Dr. Bami delay to take the opening prayer for today. Okay, shall we pray? Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 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 Our Father and our God, we thank you for this moment. Father, take all adoration in Jesus' name. We Amen. commit this program Amen. into the fatherly care. Take control in Jesus' name. Amen. Be with the speakers, be with the listeners, be with SP International, all activities today. Let it come under the fatherly directive. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. I thank you, uh, Dr. Amidele. We'll be taking the safety brief right away. Uh, the program chairman is still not here, so I will quickly take uh, the safety brief. So for, so for today, uh, we'll remind everyone that we are still uh, within the COVID-19 uh, uh, era. And uh, whatever we do, that should be behind our back. But as you can see on your screen, we expect everyone who is joining to mute their mic when they are not speaking so that we don't get to hear your private uh, conversation. And uh, if you want to speak, you raise your hand and uh, the moderator as well as the coordinators will be able to allow you to speak. Then while the presentation is going on, we want you to make comments. If you want to make a comment, start it with a C. And if you want to ask a question, start it with a Q. That way we should be able to see if and know those who have questions and those who have uh, made general comments and your questions will be answered. Then because you are going to be using an earpiece to listen, we just want you to be aware, an earpiece or a headphone, that ensure you can still hear the fire alarm if you stay in a facility that has a fire alarm system so that you are not engrossed in the meeting and you don't get to hear when there is an incident or a drill. Otherwise, be alert and aware of your environment. We expect you to stay safe uh, as per COVID-19 rule, uh, restrain from touching your face regularly, wash your hands or phone as often as possible. If you are sick, stay home, especially for those who have to go out. Uh, if you're already home, good for you. Then uh, cover your mouth when you are sneezing. I think this is the general COVID uh, rule that we all know. 
So that's the safety brief for today. Thank you. Next, Simeon. All right. So I will now invite uh, the section chairman, uh, Mr. Debola Bada, to do the welcome address. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Secretary uh, Moses, for the invitation. So welcome to everybody. Uh, uh, Moses already um, introduced me. Um, so as usual, today is our monthly technical meeting. Normally, we hold this at least once in a month. Uh, we've seen uh, sometimes that we were able to hold it uh, twice. Uh, the topic for today is clear, uh, new development in corrosion and flood detection in oil and gas facilities. So it's a look at what has worked and also what uh, can work for you. So it's speaking directly to everyone, in fact, that this, things like this have worked. I mean, this is practical. They are taking this from the field and then you can look at what can actually work for, for you too. So you are welcome again. So this Society of Petroleum Engineers uh, Port Accord section. Um, I would like to especially welcome um, um, engineer Tudeshiko, who, who is also a colleague, and he will be the speaker, and also one of our directors in SPE, uh, Dr. Michael uh, Adebite. Uh, we cannot get a better person than, than this to moderate this. So we are, in fact, we are very delighted for having him, for him to even accept, and um, luckily for us, uh, maybe schedule could accommodate this. So thank you so much, um, welcoming. And um, so as I've said the other time, so for our monthly technical meeting, it's, it's always very engaging. We like people try to network. The chat box is there for you. Do as much uh, networking you can, ask questions and so on and so forth. Uh, the secretary already mentioned that if you have a question, put a queue as a prefix to your question. And if you have comments or information or things like that, you put a C as a prefix. Uh, our engagement teams will be there. You can also do that on YouTube uh, and also on Zoom. So I'm very sure the link to the YouTube should have been in the chat box. So um, uh, basically this helps our engagement team to, to know how to channel your thoughts. Um, if it's the ones that can answer directly or the one they have to keep for the moderator and the, and the speaker, uh, so to speak. So, so besides the speaker and the moderator, I also like to welcome our directors for section 103. Um, later on, we'll be trying to introduce them further. Uh, we also have our members for section 103 and also the board members. Uh, we have our young professionals, uh, our students from the 12 chapters will be joining us. And of course, uh, all invited guests. So we we'll also have our member, uh, membership team in the engagement box, in the chat box. Uh, in case you are not a member, uh, they'll be engaging you and supporting you how to become a member. Like uh, within two to three days, they can speed it up for you and make all everything so easy, you know? So basically we should be able to finish everything by quarter past seven. We'll try everything possible to, to do that. And, um, I think that should be enough for now. I think we just have to start. So thank you. I, I wanted to really enjoy the session. Thank you very much and welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you, Section Chairman Adebola Bada for that. So uh, in the absence of the program's chairman, I am going to introduce the moderator one more time. And uh, after the introduction of the moderator, the moderator will now automatically introduce the speaker. So our moderator for today is uh, Dr. Michael A. Adegbite. Dr. Michael Adedoku Adegbite is currently the Director of Engineering and coordinates the Quality Management System in Petroleum Training Institute, Nigeria, PTI. He's a Marvin in Asset Integrity Management of Engineering Infrastructure and Learning Development Related Fields. He has authored and co-authored over 30 papers, supervised graduate thesis, and conducted notable commission projects. Michael is a certified welding inspector, CC 3.1, and holds 
a Bachelor of Science degree in Metallurgical Engineering, MSc in Welding, MLC in Offshore and Ocean Technology, and a PhD in Corrosion Engineering. He's a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers and the president-elect of the Institute of Non-Destructive Testing Nigeria, that's NDT Nigeria. He chaired the Society of Petroleum Engineers Section 104, that's the Worry Section, 2009-2010, and received many distinguished awards, including 2019 SP Projects Construction and Facilities African Region Award. He was selected Society of Petroleum Engineers Distinguished Lecturer for 2021-2022 year. He is also a Youth Ambassador for Peace, Universal Peace Federation, and Youth Federation for World Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Engineer Dr. Michael A. Adegbite is the moderator for today. And he will now introduce the speaker. Thank you. We cannot hear you. I think you have to unmute. Can we have the slide for the please? Okay. Apologies, yeah. please. Good evening. Yeah. Good evening. I'm particularly delighted and honored to be invited to anchor this uh, program. It's a great honor and wants to say a very big thank you to the session chair and all the board members and all the listeners welcoming you on board. This evening, we will be listening to a polished and a seasoned gentleman in corrosion management. He is by name Tobe Chuku Eze. Engineer Tobe Chuku Eze owes a bachelor's in engineering degree in metallurgical and materials engineering from the Federal University of Technology, Oweri, and also MSc in Petroleum Engineering and Project Management from the Institute of Petroleum Studies. That's in Port Harcourt, University of Port Harcourt. His oil field career spans over 15 years experience with Total EMP Nigeria Limited, including a brief stint at the National Petroleum Corporation uh, of National, National, Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation, NMPC. Over these years, engineer Tobechuku has gathered experience in inspection and corrosion control methods in oil and gas industry. Yes, he has overseen inspection engineering and operations ranging from deep offshore FPSO operations, inspection engineering for major projects and inspection and integrity management of aging facilities. Chobe is presently the inspection manager for Total EMP Nigeria Joint Venture Assets, covering conventional offshore and onshore facilities as well as pipelines. His core expertise is in risk based inspection, corrosion control, new inspection technology applications subsea inspection and asset integrity management. Uh, distinguished members, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted again to uh, welcome on board our guest speaker this evening, engineer Tobichuku Eze. The floor is yours, please, sir. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, doctor, just give me one second so that I can share my presentation from here.
Okay, good evening, um, Dr. Adebite, and thank you very much, moderator, for that um, introduction. Um, let me use this opportunity to as well um, say thank you to the SPE section 103, um, the directors, uh, the board members, and everyone who is here, and those who are not here at the moment, for giving me this um, opportunity um, to speak at this meeting. Uh, it's truly an honor to be in the presence of all the professionals here to share my own experience and as well um, to get your own comments and um, uh, to interact in this meeting. So this uh, technical presentation, it's uh, as already highlighted, it's talking about the new developments in corrosion and flood detection in the industry, which we are all part of. Uh, we will look at what has worked and see what can also work for you. So the content of this uh, presentation was uh, actually adapted from an SPE paper, which was co-authored by myself and engineer Moses, uh, who is also here in this meeting. Um, the details of which are on the slides. I don't, I will not go through that. The highlights of the presentation, uh, just a quick overview of what we'll be talking about. To lay the right foundation, I think it's important to discuss a little bit about what is corrosion and uh, look at sometimes why do we care about it. Um, the cost of corrosion is important in our industry. What it means to, to talk about corrosion control and management. We'll look at some, I would say, conventional ways that people like us in the industry look for defects and uh, corrosion and flaws using conventional methods, some of their limitations. And then we will look into the, I think, the meat of the presentation itself, which is um, some of the new techniques uh, where they were applied. And uh, we will conclude before we take um, questions and comments. So corrosion itself, it's basically in its simplest definition is the interaction we get when a metal uh, or its alloy um, interacts with the environment, either in a wet uh, aqueous condition and sometimes even in dry um, environments. So it can be wet or dry. Um, in the wet corrosion, we're talking about uh, when uh, there is a um, water mainly water itself provides the electrolyte for the corrosion. In the dry environment is usually um, oxygen that is the, the main driver. Um, in the dry corrosion, I would say it can occur even in, uh, in both ways, either in elevated temperatures or even in low temperatures. So corrosion, it's something that happens. It's, it's, it's part and parcel of of our process, because once we put a metal or its alloy into service, we start to immediately have to deal with this um, the phenomenon of corrosion. So why is this important? First of all, we need to understand, um, it's clear, once we put engineering materials in service, even though we look at them and they seem like it's it's permanent, it's, it's stable. The truth about it is that underneath it all, there's uh, uh, chemical uh, instability driven by the thermodynamic effect that this material, which we have taken from its ore, we find it through putting it uh, most times through heat and fire, we have added some energy into the system, wants to go back to its natural uh, state from which we extracted it. So that whole process of it trying to revert to a more thermodynamically stable condition is what we refer as corrosion uh, pretty much. So this process today is quite important in our industry because we have built a lot of our facilities from tons and tons of, of steel, mainly steel. And corrosion itself is contributing to about 25% of those failures according to studies performed by, by Wood and Van Wyck uh, Van Voyck in 2013. 
in the US, where there's a lot of um, study about this topic, there's an uh, estimated direct cost of corrosion in the US alone, which reaching $276 billion. This is uh, a study that was done by NACE in, in, in association with um, the US Department of Technologies and, 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 um, and Transportation. $276 billion in the US is what is accounted as direct cost of corrosion. In this same study, um, they estimated that by putting in place good corrosion management practices, 25 or 30% of that cost can be, can be saved. Once you put in place good practices, you can save that money. And when the study looked further, looking at the direct and now the indirect cost, the indirect cost are the costs associated to the end user, not just the corrosion management part, but what does it cost the end user when corrosion occurs? This cost now multiplies by to about 500 and something, uh, $551 billion in the US alone. On the charts on the on the on the right hand side of your screen, if, if I believe it should be on the right side, you can see the breakdown of the cost per industry. In our industry, which is uh, under the production and, and manufacturing, and some part of it is under utilities, because gas transportation is, is termed as utilities in the US, both of these uh, account for almost 50%. Of, of all these um, costs that we're, we're talking about in terms of losses due to corrosion. Now, did, okay. now on a more global scale, uh, looking globally in the whole world as, a, as, a, as a different countries, um, these costs grows to almost 875 billion US dollars annually. This is a significant amount of money. And if, we, if good practices are put in place, globally, um, between 15 and 85% of, of all that money can be saved. So what do we talk about? What do we mean about corrosion management? First of all is the assessment. You do your corrosion assessment, we put in place the mitigation measures. We monitor the effectiveness of that, the mitigation we put in place. Then inspection becomes key in the process because through inspection, we see these mitigations and the monitoring, how does it play with the material itself that we are trying to protect? And then if it works or it doesn't work, you can put in place some modifications or repairs, review your corrosion, and then it's a continuous improve improvement loop. So inspection is inspection and corrosion are, are tied in the sense that the inspection helps to check if the corrosion mitigation and monitoring systems are effective in the plant itself. So it's a continuous loop. So the for today, uh, we will try to focus on the corrosion monitoring and inspection aspects of that loop. So as I already was a bit ahead of myself, the monitoring, corrosion monitoring includes all the methods designed to verify the effectiveness and performance of the corrosion prevention. While the inspection on the other hand deals with all the methodology and the techniques that we deploy to detect the damage which has been or can be caused by corrosion and the failure um, and the prevention of this failure. So some of which inspection we look at is how effective a painting system is, how effective a corrosion uh, um, prevention mechanism is working in the plant. So let me just digress off this slide a little bit. I would liken it to when you do your medical check, you know, and the doctor puts in place some, some Mitigation, do not eat meat, don't eat too much of this, don't do this, don't do that. And also tells you what you should do to keep in health. But however, you have to check your body again to see how effective are these things, um, these 
prescriptions working for you. And when you do that check, you can liken it to being the inspection aspect of it all. So um, let me see something is on my screen. So the conventional techniques, I would, the five most um, conventional NDT techniques are listed uh, there. Most of them are well known. I will start with the ultrasonic uh, thickness measurement. Uh, just a quick rundown, it's an, uh, it's an indirect uh, measurement where you send ultrasonic uh, signals using special probes through a material um, metal. And the time it takes for the signal to come back to the receiver, that time is calculated with the velocity to give the distance, which will now be the thickness of the material. So it's, you measure the time the signal takes to come back and translate that to the thickness. In the dye penetrant, uh, methodology, we are looking for mainly uh, cracks or porosities where um, you apply a, a dye into, on the surface of the metal to be tested. And due to capillary effects, the dye um, is sucked in into the, 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 the porosity or the cracks. And with a developer, you're able to bring it out and it gives you a visual image of the defect on the surface. Similar to the magnetic particle uh, inspection, uh, a magnetic dipole is, uh, is applied across the area you want to test and, uh, and um, magnetic filings dissolved in a solution is applied and then they get attracted to the magnetic um, poles that are created by the defect. Radiographic testing is, is clear. We, we, we know, uh, everybody knows a lot about radiography and X-ray because at one time or the other, you have done it. It's just an imaging uh, using um, radiography to show what the eyes cannot see. And the visual uh, inspection is pretty much uh, a visual check uh, with the eye and the experience of the, of the inspector. But if, if you follow five of these things, uh, five of these uh, methodology described, one thing becomes clear that you are looking at a small area at any particular point in time. This is clear uh, in any of these techniques. Um, eddy current is, has evolved a lot. In fact, it's becoming um, uh, just as popular as the, as the five common ones. And it's also applied a lot in the industry. So because of these limitations, um, the scope, first of all, you are looking at a small area at a time and the limitations of these techniques, a lot has evolved over time to give more, um, to give the inspector more information and more knowledge about it, about the, the materials being tested. So just highlighting quickly um, the limitations of, of these uh, techniques, like I mentioned, the ultrasonics, you have to send a signal, um, an ultrasonic uh, sound signal through a material and measure the time it takes to get back to you. And in that time, you, you, you translate it to the, to the uh, thickness of the material. So surely you must be able to make contact uh, with that material you're testing. So if it's insulated, uh, you have difficulties because you cannot do it. Uh, the temperature limitations, of course, uh, affects the probe. So above 65 degrees, you start to get some errors in measurement. Sometimes you need uh, to get to the point where you need to measure. So you have to put in place rope access, scaffolding, etc. And, and also there are limitations for complexities of the piping systems or the, the surface you need to measure. Uh, visual inspection is limited to, to what the eyes can see. So if you cannot see it, it doesn't mean it does not exist. So it's not effective if you cannot assess the area. And it's also rigorous for, for very difficult areas like uh, flares and things like that. MPI and DPI uh, rely on similar techniques. So configuration is also a problem. The surface preparation um, it's a problem for, for these techniques. So 
these techniques are, I would say, well known, well developed, but there are limitations. If you want to, and the more complex our plants are, the more, the older they are, these routine uh, techniques kind of don't work very well anymore. So in respect to some of these limitations, um, there has been advancements. So we, where we will look at some of it in the presentation. Uh, in our industry, uh, which we all know just to lay the foundation, uh, most of the equipment where we routinely inspect are the storage systems, heat exchangers, pressure vessels, piping, pipelines, and sometimes even rotating equipment um, where we have to, to do some tests inside, inside of them. And to select an NDT technique, uh, which is non-destructive testing for, for those who may not be familiar with the term, first of all, you have to find, ask yourself, what type of damage am I looking for? Then, what size of that, what is the size of that damage, the configuration, where is it going to be likely to be located? And this technique that I, I want to choose, how sensitive or what are the limitations of this technique in finding this type of damage located in this type of place? So it's kind of, um, uh, I would say, a kind of uh, matching game, you know? to match the technique to the defect, to the location they are looking for it. So today we have to, clearly there's a need when you look at the limitations of the conventional techniques, when you look at the cost of, um, of corrosion to, to our industry, there's a clear need that we must innovate um, uh, in order to be able to identify these, these defects. So how, why do we need to do this? We need to reduce, uh, we all agree that we must reduce the risk to personnel in terms of avoid people getting, having to go into confined spaces to perform inspections, working at height, diving, all these activities expose personnel to, to risk. The cost of inspection so here lies the dynamo. Everybody agrees that inspection is, or most people agree that inspection is necessary, but are they willing to pay for it? It becomes another thing. So you have, we have to find the best inspection technique to find the damage, but at a, cheap, at a reduced cost. This, this is, uh, it becomes more, more interesting. Then, there is the growing need, not a growing need, but there's the necessity to, to keep our plants producing, to have a high operational efficiency of the plants. So why we, most everybody agrees inspection is necessary, but not everybody's willing to pay for it. But then again, not everybody's also willing to provide the equipment for inspection. So again, um, these all, boils down to the need for a better efficient uh, techniques that will give us the best quality, improve the reliability of the plants, and provide also solutions for where we say we were not able to, to do these um, inspections. For, for example, what we we'll term as non piggable lines. We'll talk about that further down in the slide. So innovating for inspection. Um, in preparing this uh, presentation, uh, we can think about it in, in these uh, four ways with the way the, um, the, the technologies are evolving and the techniques are evolving. Um, one of it is robotics. So with robotics, of course, robots can go where humans cannot go and perhaps, which is debatable, be able to acquire more data than any human can. And we need to advance the techniques that we use in order to be, of course, as I mentioned, to be more efficient and um, provide improve the reliability. Digital solutions are, are evolving where data is, a lot of data is mined. And with the more data you have, you're able to, to come with better analysis and, and better predictions. And then structural health 
monitoring. So um, this is not covered a lot in this slide, but I'll just speak about it. Um, a lot of our facilities are operating in very harsh environments, structural um, parts, mainly the platforms, FPSOs, FSOs, and, and what have you not. So all of this, you need to ensure the structural health of these um, facilities. So there are also techniques uh, for that. I covered a lot in this uh, presentation. I will deal mainly with the robotics and the advanced um, entity. So the first um, uh, technique where which most people may or some people may be aware of, uh, what we call the robotic crawlers. These are typically um, robots that are, are, are aligned with, with sensors and they're able to, to move about and acquire um, all the data that we need. So in this one there, you have a, a robot here with, with uh, equipped with UT uh, sensors, 92 of them, and able to also perform magnetic uh, flux leakage. So magnetic flux leakage is, is pretty much the same uh, technique that conventional intelligent uh, pigging uh, works with, which is uh, magnetizing the surface and applying a, a magnetic flux and uh, uh, a discontinuity or a defect is able to be, affects that magnetic flux and then it takes the data and it can be interpreted. So in this um, example, um, this field uh, in, in Argentina, which is also uh, operated by Total there, they, they had a main challenge because uh, this plant had just one fire water tank. And in Argentina, there was a lot of regulation that this tank has to be, to be inspected. Um, but to inspect the fire water tank means to empty all the fire water in which case there will not be um, any fire water fight, firefighting system on the plant and the plant has to go down. So in order to keep the production going, uh, the team worked on it and they came up with this, this robot, which I showed in the, in the previous slide, um, in order to inspect the tank. So the, this uh, robot was put in the tank, went around the whole tank surface, acquired the data and and they were able to keep all this going while the, the tank was, was operational. So with using this tool, they were able to get comprehensive thickness, find a lot of uh, some defects at the bottom of the tank. And um, the main gains uh, financially was that the shutdown of this plant would have cost about um, 800 and uh, just a little over $800,000, which was saved by spending one tenth of it. So by spending 80,000 on the inspection, they saved themselves about 800,000 in, 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 in the inspection uh, if they had to shut down the tank and take it out of service in order to perform this inspection. So you can clearly see the magnitude of savings just by applying a different um, uh, uh, technique or say technology. On, on floating units uh, today, so floating units, uh, uh, in this case, I would say FP FSOs and FPSOs. Basically, they require to undergo underwater inspections for the on the hull, the mooring systems, etc. Typically, and over the years, this is done by either using divers or a combination of diver and ROV. But today, um, the mini ROVs, which have been in operation for a while, but with higher uh, capabilities now, are providing the, cap uh, the capability to, or the opportunity to perform these underwater inspections in a cost-effective way. So with these uh, mini ROVs, we can tool them up with, to perform more. Um, the general visual inspections they can do, um, they can do all the subsea surveys, perform cleaning by water jetting or mechanical cleaning, which, which comes to very good quality. If you look at the middle picture of, uh, on the screen there, you can see um, a chain that has been cleaned to, to, to the bare metal uh, with this mineral ROV. It's almost as good as um, uh, blasting it, uh, water jetting blasting with divers. 
And the ROVs can be tooled up to perform a lot of capacity, capabilities. So underwater thickness measurement, uh, flooded member detection. Um, flooded member detection is just uh, to, to explain it. <clears throat> if you have a, a jacket, for example, a, a platform jacket offshore, you want to know if the internal of this your structural jacket is, is getting filled with water, in which case that means you have a leak somewhere. So it's called a, to a flooded member detection is the technique to, to know if you have um, flooding in, in, inside your jackets. Cathodic protection uh, CP measurement um, using proximity of contact probes. And they can also perform other surveys. Um, I would say a lot of laser scanning, uh, as you can see uh, in, in the slide. With the laser scanning, they can make measurements uh, and also support the commissioning. So this is um, existing. It's 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 been applied a lot now in order to save on, on cost. So benefits, I will go back to this slide. Clearly you can see uh, a normal ROV, uh, the work class ROV, you need a, a vessel to, to deploy it, et cetera. But with these mini ones, you can deploy it from the side of your, of your platform or your FPSO. Uh, simply, you can see the top picture there with just a simple A-frame, you hook it up and lower it in the sea and then you perform your inspections uh, comfortably from the platform. So that reduces the risk, it reduces the cost because here there are no divers. And with this uh, type of FPSOs, um, this type of ROVs, the application is becoming more diverse. You can even perform water ballast tank inspections as you can see in the lower picture on your on your um, on the right side of your screen, you can see the ROV being lowered into a ballast tank and performing this inspection. So here, we, the, the benefit is that this tank is still in operation. Uh, of course, they need to make some safety um, preparation, but they don't need to empty the tank. You don't need to put people inside this confined space uh, to perform the inspections. There are limitations for sure. Uh, because um, these ROVs typically are lightweight, less than uh, 100 kilos, and um, the payload of what it can it can carry it's, it's limited. There's uh, limited function in the articulation of the ROV arms, and like all ROVs, there's always the risk of uh, entanglement of the umbilicals. Uh, inspection drones are are, are now. Um, evolving and coming to, to light. Uh, what I mean by inspection drones are not, the, not just the drone that we, we see that takes picture, nice pictures and videos, but being able to do more. Uh, like I said, if a drone takes only pictures and videos, then it's almost doing like a visual inspection, but from far off. Here we are talking about drones that are able to perform uh, UT measurements. So as you can see uh, uh, on this on your screen there, this is a new drone that has been that has been put in service. Um, it's able to make all the range of UT measurements from spot readings to B scan and C scan, and also to do a laser scan. So tooling this tooling this um, drone to change from one to the other takes like what five minutes. Um, it lands, you take, you change it, and then it goes back up. So for sure, it's safer and it's faster. We don't have to rig up rope access or scaffold all around, for example, this type of a tank like this to take measurements along all the cost plates. Um, you reduce the saving, you reduce the cost of the inspection. You can deploy it quick and you can make more coverage of, of the tank. Um, I would, I would talk a little bit about um, corrosion under insulation because um, this is a bit of a um, uh, headache in our industry. Um, once, for sure, there is a need for, by process people and in the, in the production system to have metallic ins or insulation jacketing in order to conserve or retain uh, temperature. So, but this also creates a problem because as soon as you have um, carbon steel operating uh, 
uh, between 60 and I think 120 or 140 degrees uh, centigrade. Insulated with water ingress, you are in the prime range of corrosion under insulation. And for stainless steels, it's, it's even a bigger problem because you could have uh, cracking in this type of uh, environment and when you have salt deposition in, in the water. So uh, you can see a typical real life uh, um, example. On the picture on the left, you have this section of piping. The insulation looks like it's in good condition. But when the, um, the insulation was stripped off, you could see that already the pipe was completely gone. So insulation can look good, but the problem is existing uh, beneath. So the conventional way I would say where people um, inspect for CUI would be to strip off the insulation so that they can see what is going on beneath it. But this has its own challenges because um, of course, uh, you expose the people to, to the temperature that it's in the fluid, or you have to shut down the system to do it, or it costs a lot of money to remove the insulation and put back uh, for the sake of uh, the inspection, I would say. So post eddy current is, is, is evolving, but it, is, uh, it lays itself uh, uh, high applicability in this type of environment. Uh, post eddy current is a, um, an NDT technique where you with this you have these special coils that um, sends a magnetic um, uh, um, flux or magnetic signal through through the um, insulation and on the surface of the metal it creates some eddy currents the eddy current in itself creates again a magnetic field that is read by the signal and you're able to map um, uh, due to the changes of this eddy current, it's, it's, you're able to map uh, the condition of the surface. So this uh, is becoming very applicable for corrosion under insulation survey or even under fireproofing. Um, as you can see, uh, it, it, if you look at the lower bottom uh, picture, you can see it there with, with rollers and crawlers, with rollers. Um, so you can quickly cover big surfaces than conventional uh, UT would have done. It's, it gives a very good uh, first-hand information. Um, you can see in the screen there with, with um, the color gradients, if you have um, losses of thickness and to what extent um, in terms of percentage of losses. I mentioned a little bit about um, pipelines. So, um, we all know, uh, we, we, we know a bit of what pigging is. Uh, basically, I don't, myself, I don't know how the word pig originated, but however, um, what we put in the pipeline to either clean or to inspect the pipeline in line, in line with inside of the pipeline today is referred as a, a pig. So the pigs that are only for cleaning are the regular pigs. Uh, while we also can put more sensors and, and acquire information, and that leads to what is termed today as an intelligent peak, where it acquires um, information about the condition of the line. Um, did somebody want to say something? No. Okay, so sometimes uh, the pipe... Uh, sorry, uh, the presenter, can you just put on your video, please? If you are comfortable doing that. Okay. It's on now. Yes, thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. So some pipelines are considered um, uh, unpiggable and it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a debate that goes on in the, in the, in the, in the inspection cycle. What is an unpiggable pipeline? But Smitched in 2004 defined it that it's a pipeline that is designed to allow a standard, standard being the keyword, inspection tool to negotiate it. Um, so again, the word standard is it's it's ever shifting. What was a standard four years, 10 years ago may not be the standard today due to evolving technologies. So however, there are things that make a pipeline um, more challenging, I will use that word personally, more challenging to pig. 
uh, if it is multi diameter or it has um, bend, bends that are not easy to not negotiate with a, with a pig, or if it's connected with, with, um, with a tying on a T, uh, physical barriers, deposition like wask and all that. So that provides its own challenges. However, and I will say that there are companies that provide um, um, pigging solutions for this type of challenges. So, and everything is looked at on a case by case basis. Um, so for the sake of this, why, so if you have a pipeline that is difficult to pig, what would you, what do you do about it? Do you just accept it? Well, if you do accept it and say, we cannot pick the pipeline due to design, the problem arises because if you have a problem, your regulator will not forgive you. The regulator is clear. You need to, in most countries, um, it's required that you perform intelligent pigging of your pipeline. Where it is not piggable for any reason, you need to demonstrate that the pipeline is able to still fulfill its uh, integrity. So what do we do in this case? Well, we can modify the pipeline. Why not uh, try to remove whatever blocking points? But this will be most likely very expensive, interrupt your operations, and uh, may even not be completely possible, depending on the scenario you find yourself. So today, there are, um, I would say evolving technologies with magnetometry. I will use that word magnetometry because there are various um, um, service providers who call it different names. So, however, mag magnetometry is just, um, I would say, um, a technology that allows you to measure residual magnetic flux in the, in the material. So coming back to where we started the presentation on corrosion, we mentioned that um, uh, we take these materials from their ore, refine them through a process, and try to manufacture them into the parts that we need. Now, these parts, through this process, we induce stresses, magnetic, um, we induce stresses into the material, we, we induce a process into it. So all the material itself retains in itself some level of magnetism throughout this whole process, which is, um, I would say, residual in the material, is generated during the manufacturing uh, and construction process. But if you have a pipeline manufactured through the same process, then this um, magnetic flux is residual in it and it's repeated throughout the whole process. So it can be identified, it can be measured. And with algorithms, we can interpret what is happening in this pipeline using some sensors, which I will discuss in the, in the next slide. Am I running out of time a little bit? So I'll be quick. So in the magnetometry, um, there, hold on, did I jump one slide? Yes, I did. Okay, so in this um, case, we can perform uh, surface measurements of this residual flux of the pipeline using um, high sensitive trioxial um, magnetometers. So uh, as you can see, uh, you, you can deploy this either on, on a wagon or driven over the, the top of the pipe. With this, we detect or register the residual flux. Now that brings into effect uh, the, what is the, the phenomenon called the Villari effect. Basically what the Villari effect is, is, is highlighting is that the magnetic uh, properties are altered in the material when it undergoes stresses. So these stresses can be due to dense bend or even corrosion. So, and when this, if we understand that when the pipeline was manufactured, the magnetic flux was repeated and continuous across the pipeline, then it gets altered when there are additional things like stresses or corrosion 
And when you when it is measured, it can be with algorithms, it can be interpreted to understand what is going on in the, in the material. Another way to deploy this uh, it's, is with um, this, uh, I would say, multi-sensor balls. Um, several operators have used it and, and I have as well. So these balls are like golf sized balls. They, they, they have um, uh, equipped with like six, six sensors, um, triaxial uh, uh, magnetometers, which measure the magnetic flux as, as already mentioned, and it can be interpreted for damage and corrosion. Accelerometers. So when this ball is deployed in the, in the fluid, at, okay, I think I need to backtrack a little bit. So these balls are golf size. They can be deployed either in a free floating mode. That means you put it right in the fluid and it's transported with the fluid, collecting data. And at the end, you recover the ball and recover the data. Or you attach it to the back of a, a, a foam or by dye pig and it's launched with the pig. And at the end, when you recover the pig, you recover the ball and the data. So in this case, the balls have uh, six, six, six sensors. Um, the triaxial one measures the magnetic flux as it goes. Accelerometer helps you to, to know the pipeline geometry. Uh, it has a gyroscope to localize where are you in the, in the line? Because of course, if it is free floating, it is bouncing everywhere. So you need to know exactly how it's moving with the fluid. Uh, it has acoustic sensors that can detect um, gas leaks. So if you have a leak uh, on the line, for example, a gas pipeline, and you deploy this with a pig, it will sense the, the, the gas seepage. Um, pressure sensors, uh, which is important, um, especially in a free floating mode. Uh, if you have blockages or constriction in the line, um, the local pressure at that point will accelerate the, the flow because, of course, the area is, uh, slow, is, has been reduced, but you have the same flow rate. So you have a quick um, increase in the, in the velocity and all that, and you can tell that you have a blockage there, and you have uh, temperature sensors as well, which can help you know if your pipeline has lost um, insulation. So deploying um, these technologies can be different ways. Um, you can work the line with it, um, as already shown um, uh, with, with earlier, or you can uh, just roll it on the wagon over the line slowly. If you are center over this, the line, you can pick up the, the signals. Um, there are developments to, uh, I would say, put them on drones. Um, so that if the line is on the surface, which is not a lot in our environment, most of our pipelines are buried, it can, it can run over the, the lines or um, on, a, on, on an ROV. Um, but this also has its own challenges, especially if um, you are subsea and you cannot, your visibility is not good enough to, to know where the pipeline is. But however, even though the line is buried to about one or 1.5 meters, you will still pick this signal because on the onshore development, you're able to pick it when you have buried the pipe. So comparing uh, this uh, with other um, technologies, I hope you can see there. Uh, in terms of pipelines, uh, what is done today can be termed either you are pressure testing, you are doing an inline inspection with a conventional pig uh, or DCVG with DC CIPS for coating damage or you use magnetometry. So um, when we do a technological benchmark, we see there is some um, evolving opportunities uh, with that uh, in terms of logistical constraint geoprecision and uh, measurements that has been able to localize where the damage is. Um, the point of interest identification is tied to the probability of detection and probability of identification of the damage. And that's going for, uh, for this um, technology and the cost as well. However, there are, like every other technology, there are limitations. 
the it, it mostly will measure volumetric losses. So you, it's possible that uh, if you don't meet the um, twenty five percent relative volumetric uh, loss on the wall thickness, it may miss it. Um, you need the uh, if you are deploying a, a ball like that in in free fall free floating mode, you need the the line to be of course full of fluid. So you have a problem if you if your flow is not um, is slogging, for example. And uh, well, this is not a, should not be a challenge because uh, anybody should know what the specific gravity of the fluid they are pumping in a pipeline is. So that can be easily overcome. It, it's a good screening tool, uh, but it requires a lot of, um, uh, if you have some uh, background information on your pipeline, uh, it helps to improve the data analytics and the data assessment. And um, lastly, uh, we mentioned that uh, inline pigging with, uh, um, with pigs are, is what is, um, accepted in the technology um, by regulators. So there's still some level of um, work to be done with regulators in the future. However, um, it's presented because if you cannot perform, um, I would say intelligent pigging, you must look for a way to, to validate that your, your pipeline can still consider, continue to meet these requirements. So it's a good alternative. Um, it 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 does doesn't bring about production losses, and um, with the pipeline construction data that you have, you can improve the analytics. The other um, techniques uh, quickly. I think my time is about up. Um, using robotics inside of pipelines, as you can see, uh, this has been applied um, in the. Uh, transatlantic pipeline uh, in North America. So it's able to, to go in the pipeline, take all the data and, and come out. And uh, clampons, uh, clampons are uh, um, deployed by ROV. Uh, with, with that, you, you clamp um, this tool on, on the ROV and then you can perform either long range ultrasonics um, by sending signals that will go parallel to the surface of the pipe and you get your thickness measurements for, for a range. And um, so that these um, techniques help to, to limit what um, the unpigability of the lines. So just to conclude, because I think I'm just about a little over the time, uh, the NDT inspections are uh, a part and parcel of our industry. Um, we cannot do without them. We, we need the we need NDT to inspections to certify the condition of our plants. Um, due to the advancements in NDT, um, there's been a lot of significant advancement in order to provide technologies to identify damage, defect, and flood. Um, we, we, we need to be understand that these new technologies come with advantages, but also they come with limitations. However, with experience and certifications, we can um, go around this. Um, we don't want to, we already spent some time to talk about the cost, but the cost of the failure is always more expensive than the cost of detection. And the overall goal for flood detection and inspection is to be able to reduce failures and um, help us improve the reliability, operability, and integrity of our plants. So I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much. I hope I did not uh, go too fast or bore you, but um, thank you for listening. All right, thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you very much, Engineer Is It's, it's uh, uh, time well spent. Thank you for the delivery and good timing too. Uh, it's well appreciated. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished members, uh, I'm sure you've had uh, quite illuminating period, illuminative period with uh, Engineer Eze. And uh, we sincerely appreciate you for putting this together, together with your partner, uh, co-author, uh, putting this together, delivering this on his behalf. Um, 
a quick recap. We uh, just considered new developments in corrosion and flood detection in oil and gas facilities. So it's centered on detection of flaws of corrosion in oil and gas facilities. He took us through what corrosion is all about, the basis of corrosion, why metals corrode, why metals corrode, the economic implication of corrosion, especially uh, in developed countries, and of course in developing economies too, and in an industry as is as important as the oil and gas industry not only in terms of the uh, uh, physical cash, but also in terms of the concomitant effects, in terms of lives, in terms of uh, economic downturn, in terms of uh, breakdown of facilities and infrastructure and perhaps pollution and fire. Thank you very much. Um, you also uh, gave us an overview of the NACE impact studies in US and global uh, uh, platform, what corrosion uh, is estimated to cost. Um, corrosion management, corrosion control and management, some of the basics, uh, in terms of corrosion assessment, corrosion mitigation, monitoring, corrosion inspection, modification and repairs, and then corrosion review to see if uh, repairs or modifications implemented were effective or not, how effective they are, and take necessary measures. And coming back to the uh, dictation techniques, especially non-destructive uh, techniques. You reminded us of the conventional uh, methods of corrosion and flood detection, and that being uh, UT, that's ultrasonic testing, liquid or dipenetrant uh, technique, the magnetic testing, the radiographic testing, the visual, and also the eddy current testing. And you highlighted the fact that each and all these uh, conventional techniques uh, have limitations, regardless of their complementary roles, there are still limitations in terms of flaws or corrosion that could be detected. And uh, some of uh, this has necessitated the need for innovative uh, measures and techniques so that we can uh, effectively uh, inspect aging facilities and as well as be able to know the structural health conditions of new infrastructure with respect to new materials, which are usually uh, uh, now being uh, fabricated using new materials or smart materials. So there's need to be able to interact with these components and know exactly how they are feeling or their state. You establish the need for innovative inspection techniques as a result of the uh, uh, limitations of conventional and even advance some of the advanced uh, methods. Then you uh, took us through an overview of what this inspection innovation cycle is all about. Inspection robotics, inspection being uh, the stage at which data is being gathered. The status quo 
of uh, compon of components is being uh, uh, mined. Data is being mined from the various components, and some of these, unfortunately, are situated in confined spaces or uh, inaccessible areas, and the need for us to be able to still get data using robots, uh, various forms of robots. You mentioned the structural health monitoring, the advanced NDT techniques, and all this together revolving around digital solution in terms of big data and uh, then on to uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So bringing together modern information technology to bear in terms of uh, asset integrity management. Uh, very, very brilliant. Uh, this is very good. And well, data gathering systems in restricted areas, I've mentioned that. And uh, the likes of not just robotics now in controlled or confined spaces, but also many uh, ROVs are being deployed in offshore facilities for underwater inspection and other services, uh, flooded member uh, detection and to monitor uh, the structural health of the infrastructure. Also, uh, you called our attention to the emergence of inspection drones, not just cameras, but rather inspection drones. Uh, not just for visual inspection, but much more being applied in ultrasonic uh, testing, B scan and C scans. And also, this is being done. Uh, in a timely and economic as well as effective manner. Uh, corrosion under insulation is one of the challenges uh, in the industry in terms of uh, detection. And you made mention of the use of pulse eddy current to effectively uh, detect this. That's also quite illuminating and quite relieving too, to operators of infrastructure and also comforting to the regulators. Um, inspection of pipelines, the conventional method uh, of pigging, whereas there are a number of systems out there, pipeline systems that are unpiggable uh, perhaps because of difference in diameters or configurations and all some other factors. And uh, way out, which has been deployed successfully, though not without limitation, is the uh, magnet, magnetometry. That's very, very good. And the basis of this, you made us to realize is exploiting the alteration of the magnetic properties or the magnetic flux of components in stressed state. So this enables us to be able to detect defects in such components. Very, very brilliant way of applying basic physics. Thank you. Multi-sensor uh, Pipe uh, balls is also one of the new techniques being deployed out there. And they are being deployed in a number of ways, uh, manually or semi-automatic, or perhaps even being fully automated. And all these technologies are being benchmarked too. That's very, very brilliant because we need to compare Apple with Apple and be able to take decisions with our eyes open. Very brilliant. Yes, these new technologies are also not without their limitations, but there is room for improvement. And also the regulators 
need to key into this. Uh, NDT techniques, you concluded that they are necessarily and mandatorily integral part of asset management in oil and gas industry. The need to acknowledge that the technologies out there or conventional technologies are limited and the need to roll up our sleeves to ensure the integrity of infrastructure so as to avoid the, uh, the penalties or perhaps the negative effects also stressed. And of course, there's room for improvement of these technologies, room for data, room for uh, research, and wider room still exists for improving these methods. Want to say a very big thank you to you once again, Engineer Tubechuku, for taking us through this. And uh, we I trust that a number of us, in fact, every one of us, uh, we've learned so much. And uh, perhaps a few being reminded of these technologies and how they could be deployed. And some of the uh, basics that we take for granted, we now are able to see the link between the theory and practice. Thank you very much once again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will want to request that you give a round of applause. Yeah, perhaps putting on your uh, uh, microphone or mute and just, you know, let's appreciate, give an applause to our speaker, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, we can unmute now. A number of questions have been mined. Uh, we've been able to pick some, and I uh, will quickly go on to these questions. Yes, uh, uh, distinguished lecturer, I'm sure you'll be able to uh, throw more light to some of these questions and clear the doubt to some of us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the very first question is from uh, Olubenga Dejun. Have you looked into using guided wave technology for pipe for your for pipeline? It has the highest probability of is, of detection. The use of guided wave technology. I think I would just want to take that before moving on to uh, the next one, please. Yes, please, uh, speaker. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Olubenga, um, for that question. Yes, it has been uh, looked into, and um, even though not covered in this uh, presentation, but it's been looked into. If you recall the last, I think it was the last slide, unfortunately, I went a quick, quickly through it because I was delayed. I was already late. Uh, I mentioned about being uh, clamp on some pipelines where we can do some long range uh, ultrasonics and of course guided waves as well. So that is um, uh, that was covered in that section. Yes, it was looked into. Oh, great. Thank you very much. So uh, can robotic crawler be similarly used in crude oil tank, story tanks? without having to drain them. Uh, well, the second part are the mini ROVs capi capabilities limited to only underwater visual inspection. So two in one from Daniel. Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel, for that question. Um, there's a limitation, I would say, of um, applying robotic crawlers in, in crude oil tanks. Mainly one, it's um, uh, first of all, anything you put in the crude oil tanks has, has to be ATEX rated for safety. So um, that is one limitation. Uh, and two, the second limitation is most crude oil tanks have um, sludge um, already existing at the bottom. So it provides itself um, another limitation of this technique because you must be able to assess the, the tank bottom. So that's the limitation. 
Um, uh, are those, at least those are two limitations. But however, if you get the tank cleaned, then it, it could be possible if it's empty, but those are two key um, areas. Um, your second question regarding ROVs um, being limited to visual. No, um, visual is just one part of it. The ROV, as I mentioned, um, can be tooled up to perform a lot of different things, um, uh, flooded member detection, um, ACFM, um, uh, UT thickness, laser scans, thickness measurements, um, laser measurements. So it depends, you, you tool it up um, according to the payload that the, the ROV can, can safely handle and the articulation of that ROV. So there is not limited to visual only. I hope that answers uh, the question, Daniel. Uh, I believe, yeah, that it's not limited. It's straight for, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, other applications uh, could be uh, could be used uh, with respect to uh, the, the ROVs could be deployed to do other things other than visual inspection. Thank you very much. Uh, third question is from uh, first. Uh, wants to know if these new technologies, does these new technologies, uh, what proportion of inspection can they be used for? And are these new technologies now widely accepted? Well, I think uh, in the later part of the presentation that was also mentioned. But then, please, here's a question. You can go ahead, please. In terms of the proportion of inspection that these new technologies could be useful and in terms of acceptance. Yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm not sure I understood uh, what the term proportion uh, means. Uh, is it the range of which it can be applied? Uh, I think that was also covered um, in the presentation. As, uh, if you refer to, for example, uh, sensors, um, with, with magnetometry, they can do flux uh, measurements. Uh, they can measure other, other things like acceleration. I help you know if you have um, restrictions or blockages in the line and your pipeline geometry. Um, uh, in terms of uh, post eddy current, um, you can use it through, through insulation and, 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 and to measure um, um, losses. So I wasn't, I'm not quite sure what that term uh, proportion um, meant in the, in the question. Perhaps if you can um, send back uh, the question with a bit clarification, I'll be able to address it. Um, on the second part is widely, uh, if it was widely accepted or widely used, um, yeah. not yet um, widely used. It's why they are still emerging or new um, technologies that provide advantages for where we were not able to, to uh, carry out inspections. So it's not yet widely used. It's been used, uh, several operators uh, and total, and I'm sure a lot of, of uh, I know Shell and uh, Chevron have used some of this as well. So um, operators are catching on. Regulators are also being um, made aware of, or they are also aware of this and they're looking at the efficacy of um, of, of these uh, technologies. And I'm sure in the, in the future, some of it will become um, uh, much more widely accepted. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, the, the next question from Ajibola. Ajibola is uh, interested in uh, looking at the future. Is it likely that the industry will need more technical personnel than people with coal, oil, and gas background? That's in terms of uh, the latest innovations in oil and gas inspection or inspections in oil and gas. I want the inspection in oil and gas. Uh, how do you consider? The, the level of technology that personnel will need to acquire now or have to be satisfied with in rather. Okay, um, 
Thank you, um, uh, Ajibola, for that. If um, your question is related to, to inspection and its trade, I think that uh, the world today is, is, is lending itself to, to high technology and, and, and all that. So in terms of skill, I, I, I see um, uh, still a high demand for, for people with, with knowledge and good technology skills in the, in the industry. Um, today, everybody is talking about data and data and data. And using data means the data must be acquired. The data will not acquire itself. That's, that's for sure. So if you are going to get data to be able to, to, to understand and to run your plant, you need to understand, you need to have ways to acquire that data and to also use it. So if you recall the innovation, uh, digital was in the middle but there must be ways to acquire that data in order to feed the digital platform. So there will still be need for that, in my view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another thought or rather question uh, is if, if peak pipeline, peak pipeline intelligent gauge, uh, what about, I think there are some typos there. What about cleaning pigs, e.g. BD foam pigs and the like that are not intelligent, uh, perhaps looking at other pigging systems. Now, uh, consideration, if there have been consideration for such or exploiting such technology in the respect of this new technology now that has been uh, considered or been explored. Yes, that's uh, the thought of one, uh, well, his name is not uh, on now. But perhaps you may wish to make comments on other types of pigging and uh, forms used in pigging and how appropriate or how efficacy they are in picking and intelligent systems. Yes, please. All right. Um, I, I think these are referring to the, the pigs that are used uh, for cleaning um, the, the, pipe, the pipeline. Um, are there, is the question related to how if the technology is also developing for them uh, in terms of, uh, in, the, in that sense, they, they don't, those types of pigs are not used. For example, the foam pigs come in different ranges, low density, medium and high density ones on the by dyes um, uh, are created with, uh, some of them carry sensors for sure, but they're not um, deployed for inspection purpose that are deployed for other purposes for like cleaning the, the pig uh, or to push um, a fluid uh, as a spacer, more or less, to push a fluid or to displace a fluid. So they are not deployed for inspection uh, purposes, strictly speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. One brilliant comment okay. from... Uh, Thank uh, you. Dave. I think I have to chip in quickly. Uh, for the moderator and uh, speaker, I believe we are enjoying the session very, very well, but uh, we we'll also uh, consider the time. So yeah. we we'll just maybe take one more question, but I would like the moderator to eventually use the floor, maybe to end the question and answer section to engineer Dr. Ojo, who has raised his hand. Oh, okay. Why? Now, okay. So that we can uh, take the other things before it's time. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, intervention. I'll just take this comment and then we'll take uh, Dr. Ojo. Uh, Dr. Ojo, good evening, sir. I'll take you in a moment, please. So you may just be about to unmute. A uh, brilliant comment from Olubenga Adejumo uh, says, globally, the NDT world is moving towards artificial intelligence. Moving towards artificial intelligence condition monitoring approach. Good to know that it is also in the right direction in the Nigerian oil and gas sector. 
Thank you very much uh, for this uh, encouraging uh, comment. I want to encourage all facility managers to key into this technology. So with this, I want to quickly invite Dr. Ojo, please. Dr. Ojo, sir. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I thank you for inviting me. Whoever invited me to this forum, I suspect it's Dr. Adibite. I thank you. Um, I'm so thrilled by this presentation of uh, engineer Tobe Chukuku Aziz. Uh, it's a confirmation to me that um, uh, we in Nigeria, we have the knowledge and we have uh, the skills. Uh, he spoke with such authority that humbles me and gives me a lot of material for the course that uh, we run in Bells University as part of the MEng in Mechanical Engineering. That is a course called uh, Non-Destructive Testing. Um, I. I think he's a perfect, this is a perfect example of um, how um, with little science, with uh, little knowledge of technology, we can make our young engineers relevant to the industry. All we're talking about in inspection, inspectioneering, non-destructive testing, does not, it's not rocket science. And by the time you've done A-level physics, radiography, A-level ultrasonics, you have it. You have the basics, you have the fundamentals. And so why can't we begin to use those basic sciences to find ways for our people in the industry to find work? This is what is driving uh, the courses that uh, I set up specifically for the oil and gas industry. I'm very thankful. I have a lot of materials to use and um, I hope you don't mind. Uh, the question on my mind is about uh, eddy current uh, non-destructive testing of pipeline, the capability of it in sense of uh, detecting uh, defective welds when the pipelines are thick walled. Uh, by that I mean above uh, eight millimeters and so on, uh, that can be categorized as thick walls. Eddy currents, are they efficient? Pulse eddy, are they efficient for thick walls? I'll be grateful for an answer. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Ujo. It's, um, I thank you very much for your very kind comments at the beginning. And, um, and also the advice you put uh, forward for everyone in this uh, meeting today. Um, uh, one of the limitations of eddy current is the ability to permit uh, thickness. So eddy current oh. itself is limited by the thickness of the material you want to test. Nice. Yes, because, it's, uh, because of the way the technology is on its own. Uh, then post eddy current um, can permit thicker materials uh, better than eddy current from my experience. I see. I see. Thank you very much. I wouldn't take more of your time, but if you permit right. me, I will try to link up with you some other way. Thank you. Uh, it will be a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Ojo. Yes, uh, again, a big thanks to our guest lecturer today, Engineer Tubechukweze. Thank you very much for sharing these thoughts, these technologies with us, and encourages, encouraging all of us to key into this and to the need to ensure that our infrastructure are better managed for uh, better productivity. Thank you very much for the wonderful time we have had together. And I want uh, to quickly uh, invite the- Can I have a minute, to... uh, if you don't mind, moderator? Okay. Yes, go yeah, ahead. Right. <laughs> I want to use this uh, one minute uh, quickly to, 
to extend, extend my gratitude to everyone um, who is um, here um, for listening uh, for the past uh, one hour. I hope that um, through this interaction, you there's something uh, uh, for you to take back. It's been uh, my pleasure to be able to speak to a distinguished audience uh, such as this, um, and also look forward to opportunities in the future. Let me also spe specially thank uh, the moderator, uh, Dr. Debite, uh, for his um, uh, the way he has managed this whole process uh, through the presentation. I'm very grateful to you and to everyone here as well. So thank you so much, and I wish you all the best. Um, I will turn off my mic and hand back over to, to Mr. Bada because I think he's looking at the time as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Mama. All right. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the time. Okay. So thank you, um, um, the presenter, Tobeshiku. Uh, is really appreciated, and our able moderator and the distinguished. Lecturer, of course, for 2021, 2022. We are going to be waiting for that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Michael Adebite. Um, we really appreciate this. Uh, and also, we just want to thank uh, TOTA for sponsoring this. Um, TOTA always want a situation where hands on uh, lecturers that knows uh, the the, 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 that knows the stuff to, to present and so that people also can learn practically. Uh, and, and that is why they, they sponsored it. So thanks to also to Tota on that. Um, and, and I'm very sure for people that want to link to uh, Tobe, you can always find him on, on LinkedIn. If you allow us, uh, honorable speaker, also to share your presentation to the attendees, we'll really appreciate that. So uh, just to uh, conclude on behalf of Section 103, the board um, and the directors, we, we thank the presenter and then the uh, moderator for, for this wonderful uh, event. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Over to you, the facilitator, uh, Moses. Thank you for the honor. Thank you, sir. OK, thank you. Uh, Simeon, you can put the screen back because I can't see it, unless if it's peculiar to me. The screen is on and to I'm my end. I'm sharing my screen. On. OK. The agenda is shared. Yeah. Maybe it's my network. What's the next? I can't see the screen, actually. So OK, maybe, the uh, next. OK, good. I can see it now. Uh, It's question of the day. We have question to, of the day. Question of the day. So we have to quickly uh, go to the next uh, sessions. We are almost uh, within the time, actually. So question of the day. Marian? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Hello, Marian. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I'll, I'll be fast about this. We've had a lot of intensive discussions. So for this month of April, we had four Next questions. Next slide, Simeon. So, yeah, we had four questions. So two of the questions were all on well kill method, and the other one was a question on data science. And the fourth question was just a random question for people who visit our YouTube channel to, to watch our post event. So we asked the question on Tesla Factor as discussed by Professor Udubisi. So we added a link where people can go and watch the video and ask the question. The participation was good. And at the end of the question of the day for the month of April, we had three winners. Next, yeah, we have three winners. So we have Joshua, who is with Shell, and we have Hilary, one of our young professional, and we have Apanjo, who is a student with University of Uyo. Congratulations. Uh, we'll be sending them airtime, which I think we've done. We've sent them airtime. And we'll also be share, we'll also send them their certificates of excellence and of participation. Thank you very much. We do this every month. And we indulge that you always participate. Thank you and see you next month.
um, facilitator boy. Uh, Simeon, are you there? Okay, the next is on a membership. Okay, do we have a membership team there that wants to take this? Okay. So, okay, I will just take so that I won't waste time. So, uh, you have another slide after this. Can, can I check the next one? What's there? Okay, so basically leave it here. So um, just to share basically for people that are not uh, already members of um, SP, uh, it will be nice. You see, we do um, technical presentations, networking like this a lot um, in different uh, events, not only monthly, uh, quarterly. There's a lot of events that we do and also socially, we try as much as possible to, to connect uh, with people of, uh, uh, of technical minds of such. So you can always um, be a member. We have a link that normally, um, Simeon, you're gonna post the link. So you can click on the link and then you just put your name and phone number. And our membership team is gonna contact you, uh, connect you and uh, do everything possible within just few days to regist register you as a member. So section 103 portal code is just one of those five um, sections uh, in Nigeria. Um, so, uh, and um, we have members, friends of more than 1,000. We have 12 universities, including Cameroon University under our section. And I'm very sure many of our students are, are in this uh, forum, uh, including the young professionals. So um, if we combine everything from young professionals to members and then to students members, we are approximately like, uh, uh, potentially 4,000 uh, members strong. So I, I feel this is a kind of organization you would like to, to belong to uh, as uh, much as possible. So they will post the link there and then uh, we will really uh, like you to click the link with your name and then phone number, they will contact you. Uh, as you can see, there is a lot of benefits of uh, being a member from training to certification, a lot of meetings, technical um, uh, meetings, uh, and a lot of materials on the sp.org that uh, you can use for your career, for your studies, for your own personal life, a lot of things. Uh, you go there in as much as you remember. And a lot of paid events, it's either you're giving discounts or you don't even pay at all. You know, there are some we do free, but there are some also that are paid events because it depends on the level of, 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 of the forum, in fact. Um, is there anything next? So um, this is open to students, it's open to graduates, um, also uh, young professionals and very senior professionals. At any time you can join uh, SP. You don't have to be a petroleum engineer. We always say this at all times. You, don't, you just have to have the, 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 the interest of the energy industry in your mind. So we have lawyers, in fact, we have accountants because there's always something you can do in SP to move the world forward. I think that is the that is the that is the key thing. Uh, so we always like to seek knowledge in order to to better the energy uh, industry. Okay, so uh, Simon, you just post the link on the chat, uh, and then um, I'm very sure you'll see the link, and then you can click and put your name and your number. Uh, it's basically just eighteen thousand in a year, and I can tell you this is the cheapest. I belong to so many organizations. This is the cheapest you can get on any international organization that is highly befitting, uh, like uh, Society of Petroleum Engineers. A uh, subsequent uh, year, you'll be paying just for 14,000. Okay, so thank you very much on that. Next, next, we go to the next. Uh, so let, let's quickly take the picture and then we'll come back to announcements when we have the full house now. So please, we'll indulge you. Uh, to so put on your video, uh, put on your video, and then we'll take, we we'll just spend 45 seconds to take this picture. It will be nice. If it's a physical event, you know, we'll all take pictures together, which is always nice. Uh, but for this, we have to take it from the screen so that at least you can point out and say, yeah, I was there. So very quickly, just 45 seconds, and the time starts now. It will also be nice for you to give us some level of smile 
just mind not really laugh, you know. It was so that the picture would look beautiful. <laughs> we always want that. <laughs> so thank you. That is approximately 12 seconds. Um, so Simeon is taking the pictures. Please don't forget the smile. 45 seconds of smile for a day should be enough. <laughs> okay, we have our 18 seconds now. So Simeon, if you are done, just tell me. Uh, we're getting to 22 seconds, 24, 26. We are getting to 30 seconds. Just 15 more seconds for your smile, please. <laughs> And then we are just going to 35 seconds. Simeon, you are ramping up. Simeon, we are getting there. That is 40 seconds. And then the last smile of five seconds. <laughs> For those that love me smiling. <laughs> yeah, we are good. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. If you want to continue to smile, it's fine. But for us, we're good. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So on the agenda, what next? Uh, very quickly, so that. Uh, but we are good. We are good with the time. Actually, we're good with the time. Next. Okay. I think it should be. Uh, okay. So uh, basically, this one just introducing the the board of section one hundred three. We have uh, 17 uh, members that are um, uh, facilitating all the events for the year since last September. Uh, normally our board is for a year, and then um, by September, again, we'll have another board. So these are the 17 uh, board members facilitating all the events. So great thanks to them. So we have some upcoming events. If you don't follow us on uh, social media, this will be the best time. Uh, just type in SP Port Accord in LinkedIn, in uh, Instagram, Twitter, or on Facebook. You just type in uh, SP Port Accord. Uh, we are always trending there, so you always get us. And uh, if you want to watch our past videos, uh, you can always go to YouTube. Also, just type in SP Port Accord, and you see all of them recorded and then you can watch them at your own time. We have some events on the 1st of May, which is on the Workers' Day. We're gonna be going to two uh, markets to distribute to them uh, nose mask and also to, to um, give some awareness on the COVID-19 because we still discover that people don't still believe there's COVID-19, there is, it's real. So we're gonna be distributing uh, to, to them. I think it's about uh, 500, uh, there are about uh, people that they have uh, given us their consent to come and give them a mask. Next slide, please. Okay, we also have this um, um, clean energy and artificial uh, intelligence. Um, this is our STEM program. In fact, Total is also sponsoring this for us. Uh, it will hold May 15. Uh, this one will challenge uh, the secondary school. We also challenge the university students to come up with projects, especially science projects, uh, artificial intelligence projects, you know, digital projects uh, that, in fact, that can that could be commercialized, something like that. And then we have judges. Uh, and, and honestly, we have very good uh, gifts uh, from from Total and a lot of recognition uh, for this uh, genius that's going to that we're going to have after after this so it will be may 15 uh, so keep a date with us next slide okay we also have the sustainable development goal number 13 if you know about the sustainable development goal very well 13 is about climate change in fact so the theme is defending tomorrow the climate crisis and threats against land water bodies and environment in a post covid 19 era this one is taking place 7th of May. That should be next week, Saturday, thereabout. So 7th of May, keep a date with us. You, can, you will see them on our social media. So you can just likewise uh, just um, uh, book, book, that, book that in your calendar. We also have uh, an, a challenge here that we are offering some, some cash prices. Also, um, you will see, I think the deadline is 30th. In fact, the deadline is tomorrow. 
it's been up for the more than two weeks. So you can still be a part of it. It could be for fun. And if you win the money, you want to donate to any of our students who will like that also if you're a senior professional. So it's very nice. They, they, it's very easy. They, they ask them to do a video uh, and the video should be on the, uh, a, I think from six to eight years old should be able to understand it, you know, or four to 12 years. That means children should be able to understand your scientific video that is based on something regarding the sustainable development goal. So you see, so we want people also to go to basics. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we'll be having our annual golf event. This one will take place in uh, uh, Portacourt Golf Club, uh, yeah, Club, which is uh, Python. Python is around nav base. We'll be having uh, national and international uh, people coming around, but particularly it's also a charity event yearly. So we are partnering with uh, Money. Money actually is a non-for-profit organization that focuses on mental illness. Okay, so they give us lectures on mental illness. They do a lot of uh, consulting. They do a lot of support for mental illness. And you agree with me that especially this period of COVID, that a lot of people will be sitting at home. A lot of people are working from home. Uh, there's so much stress. Uh, for me, I think it's even becoming aggravating. So uh, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to call ourselves. We need to take care of ourselves and ensure uh, nobody goes into depression or any form of mental illness. So we'll be supporting them for the great work they've been doing. Next slide. Okay, and, and that's it. Uh, those are social uh, media and those, but the easiest one, you just type in SPE port accord, and then you are gonna get it. It's so easy from, our, from the uh, YouTube and also to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, so uh, I think that is my announcement. I'll just give a very quick uh, remark, um, closing remark. I really thank again, um, Engineer Tobesho Kweze. Uh, I thank uh, also the, the moderator, um, our very senior uh, director in SP, Dr. Uh, Michael Adepite. As I said earlier, it's also the 2021-2022 uh, distinguished lecture. So you'll be coming around to present a lot for us uh, from September through next year. All over the world, you'll be presenting that. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate also Tuta for sponsoring this and also ensuring that uh, things we, we acquire in the field, we bring it back uh, for people to benefit. Um, one striking thing I've seen that uh, the presenter mentioned is about um, the, 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 the costs due to issues of corrosion and so on and so forth. And they mentioned for only US alone that they lost about $276 billion annually. And that that is direct cost. And that the indirect cost is double of that, about $551.4 billion per year. And that is the whole essence of all this presentation, trying to see how we can minimize costs. As in the industry, in the energy industry, we always want how can we do better? How can we reduce costs? But at the same time, how can we do better? improving what we are doing. So I think he has done so much justice to that. And this, this what I mentioned is just only in the US. Now we have not talked of the whole world. You can imagine those money can be converted for other things like charity and to help the world to, to grow better. Okay, so um, um, I think also I would just like to, uh, for, for the students especially and some wife, young professionals, I think this is also a very good opportunity for you to, to know that uh, uh, through meetings like this, you can gain a lot of knowledge, a lot of connection, a lot of network. So this is not for waste at all. Let's try everything possible to take this thing seriously. Go to YouTube. You can download this. You can send it to your friends. This can out for any interview anyone wants to ask you about uh, corrosion, about NDT. Anything they want to ask you is there. So please, let's try as much as possible to make use of uh, SP materials and, and resource, uh, especially. So thanks again to Tobey. You can connect to Bechuku and also Moses Alon, which is our secretary. You can connect them on LinkedIn. It's free. LinkedIn is free. You can always connect them there. So thank you again uh, to be, uh, to be, if you permit us, as I said earlier on, 
would like to share your materials, but we'll talk offline if, if you agree to that. Uh, and also you will see that in the chat box, we are giving, uh, we are asking for phone numbers of our students, in fact. So what we do throughout this period is to try as much as possible also to encourage our students to attend our events. As you know, things are very difficult. These things are hard. And then uh, staying online for like two hours consumes a lot of data. So we try as much as possible to support most of our students. And that's why you see that we are asking for their uh, phone number. And then we're going to give them data, put it on their phone, uh, so that also to continue to encourage them to attend events like this. Uh, so thank you to our team that have been managing, uh, managing that. Um, so again, I would just like to thank the speaker, the moderator, uh, the young professionals of Section 103, uh, our students from the 12 chapters uh, in, in the South, South, Southeast, and including Cameroon, and all the guests. We really appreciate that. For those that are not SP members, uh, it's a great opportunity. Click the link uh, in our chat box, and, and that's it. Um, so uh, at this point, I, I would like to, to, to say also, don't forget, as I said earlier on, you can watch this again, download on our YouTube channel. You can always do that. So um, uh, I, I noticed that many of our directors also came on board, and I'm very sure some of them are on board. So we really appreciate the director of Section 103. We also appreciate some other sections uh, in Nigeria and also abroad that have been joining us. We appreciate we, we believe we'll continue doing this again. Next month, we have another uh, technical uh, lecture of this that's of great influence like this one. So thank you very much. We appreciate. And then please be watching our chat box. I can see our team are putting nice, nice, uh, interesting things there for your awareness and for your info. So, so thank you very much. We appreciate your coming and we wish you the very, very best. Thank you. Thank you, SC. We want uh, one of the students to do the closing prayer. So a volunteer from the students to give us a closing prayer and that will be official end of the event, even though you can stay behind one more time up to 7.45 before we log you out. A student volunteer for closing prayer. What are all our students? that I've been posting their phone number. <laughs> One person should do the prayer. One person should do the prayer. Enjoy. Um, thank you for Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, this man, to give us a closing prayer. Okay. Give us a closing prayer. Lord, we pray that whatever we have learned, we will seek the name in the name of Jesus. Continue to keep us healthy and strong. Continue to keep moving. We are going to move forward in the name of Jesus. We pray, oh God, even as we are going back to our various destinations and as we are going to take a sleep this night, Lord, we pray that you guide and protect us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because we have answered our prayers. For in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Please, you can continue to network in the chat box. You can continue to, to make your comments, information. Anything you want in the chat box until they close the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I think that's. Thank you again. So Moses, you can put your background and music as well.